Welcome back, everybody. This will be a continuation of the first Managed Basic Networking video, where we covered configuring IPv4 and IPv6 addresses on a virtual private server. It's a pretty cool video. I encourage you to check it out. Today, we'll dive into the remaining three objectives, and we can start by talking about configuring hostname resolution. Now, I already made a long video about this a while back, but I have a nice opportunity here to return to this topic and boil it down to the essentials. So let's begin, shall we? So to start, here's what I'd like you to know. There is a framework on many Unix-like systems called the Name Service Switch, or NSS, and it's used to figure out what services should be used to resolve names and in what order. The configuration file for name service switch is called nsswitch.conf, and it's located in the etc directory. Let's take a look at it, actually. Here it is, and I'll scroll down to the bottom where all the juicy stuff is at. So right now, we only really care about our system's ability to resolve host names. So we're going to focus in on the host section right here. And as you can see, the default order that software will look for host names on this system is first with files, so this is referring to the etc host file. Second is with DNS, which is configured in etcresolve.conf. And third is with a plugin called myhostname, which is something extra, it just returns how to resolve the local hostname. The first two are the important ones right now. So let's quickly go ahead and check out those files I mentioned. So we can start by checking out etc hosts, and in this file, you can change the IP address that your local machine resolves a certain name to. By default, these settings will take top priority because they're defined first in nsswitch.conf. So anyways, I could do something like make example.org always resolve to the address 1.2.3.4 by doing this. So the format of this file should be pretty self-explanatory. The address goes on the left and the name goes on the right. And in fact, you could put in any name or alias here. It doesn't even have to exist. Like I could make blah always go to 127.0.0.1 like so. There we go. And yeah, let's try this out. So I'll save the file. And now if I try to ping example.org it's going to go to the address that we set. And a similar thing is going to happen with blah. So if I try to ping blah, it's going to go to our loopback address, which is what we set in the file. But what if we change the order of the entries in NS switch? Let's try that. So I'll then back into NS switch and we'll move up here and add DNS to the front of this list. And now if I go back here and run ping example.org again, it's resolving to the actual IP address on the internet this time, because DNS is being searched first now. However, with blah, uh, the DNS server has no clue what we're talking about, so it still gets resolved by the host file, which is next in order this time. So yeah, it'll still go to our loopback address. So I'll cancel that. And I'll go ahead and change everything back to normal now. So in here, I'll make the host file first. And in etc hosts, I'm going to get rid of these. Cool. So I hope that made sense. Um, let's work on changing our DNS settings now. The file that I'd like to show you is etcresolve.com. This is where programs find the IP address for the DNS server. Now, the RHCSA is all about persistence, so we won't be modifying this file directly, but rather doing it through Network Manager instead. You can see up here it says Generated by Network Manager, and this is important to be aware of because this file will get refreshed every single time the Network Manager daemon restarts. Uh, okay. So currently, our DNS server is set to this local one in the lab. 
and this local DNS server I have here knows how to resolve the host names of other computers in this lab network. Also, I guess I'll mention this search part over here appends this local domain name labnet to single word host names that we try to look for. Anyways, uh, going back over here, uh, we're still able to access internet domain names because this DNS server recurses its resolution up to Google's DNS server 8.8.8.8. .8 That's why I can ping the name net server, which is the host name of our DNS server, and that works. And I'm also able to ping ibm.com, a name out on the internet, and that works just fine as well. Now, what if I wanted to bypass the local DNS server and have my machine go directly to Google's DNS instead, 8.8.8.8? .8 well, I can do that with NMCLI or NMTUI by editing the connection profile. So here I can run NMCLI con show, and there is my profile. And then I can do NMCLI con mod, and then I'll just have to give the connection name, so bear with me, uh, tab completion save the day. And then I'll set IPv4.DNS to 8.8.8.8, .8 just like that. Then I will restart Network Manager uh, with systemctl restart Network Manager. And now if I check etc resolve, you can see here that 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 is at the beginning. So it's been changed to Google's DNS. Now if I try to ping net server, you can see that it doesn't work anymore. But I can still reach it by its IP address, of course, 10.0.0.1. That works just fine. However, with any names understood by Google's DNS, this will definitely work. So I could still ping IBM.com like nothing ever happened. Okay. We just configured hostname resolution in two ways. Now I'm going to bring all of the stuff I just changed back to normal when I'm done making the video because I liked how it was set up before, but of course changing your DNS server to something else is a totally valid thing to do. Um, in fact, in the previous video where I was setting up the VPS, uh, that's exactly what I did. I set it to Google's DNS server. So we definitely learned a lot um, and that's always good. So next we'll move into the objective configure network services to start automatically at boot. This is going to be a piece of cake. So let's power through this one. What they're talking about could be any network service like SSH, VSFTPD, NGINX, NFSD, Samba, and the list goes on. But we'll just do the obligatory HTTPD. So we'll just install that with yum install HTTPD. There we go. And uh, we'll just enable this service with systemctl enable httpd. Cool. And I mean, that's about it. But that seemed a little bit too easy. So I can tell you a little bit more about the internals for some background, I guess. Systemd services are dependency based. So they start up in a certain order so everything works smoothly. The unit file we just enabled is already configured to only start when the network is ready to go, so we didn't need to actually do anything. But let's make this tricky for a second. Perhaps on the RH CSA, this would be really difficult for whatever reason, but they give you some proprietary services unit file to configure, and then what you would want to do is make sure that it starts up when the network is available. So one way to do this would be to override some of the instructions in the existing unit file to make sure that the dependencies are clearly stating that the service needs to be up when the network is running. Now, I think this is pretty above and beyond, but why not go over it, right? So here's a way to check and take care of that. What you would want to do is run systemctl edit and then your unit file. So for in our case, that's just httpd.service and you'll get this big commented out file. So uh, what's here below 
um, in comments is the existing unit file. And you can see here that everything was already good to go. We have this after key that says after network.target, which is correct. I mean, this is a network service, so it should start after the network is up. But let's say that this wasn't like this. Then what we would probably wanna do is go up here and then add um, a override to unit and put in after equals network dot target. Now this is only going to make a slight difference to this unit file because it was already configured like that. In fact, um, it's actually going to have less features going on because there's some other stuff that's supposed to be started um, before this HTTPD is up and running. But whatever, it, it's probably going to be fine in this case. But if this wasn't a unit that was configured properly to start after the network is up, then this is how you would override that to make sure that it does. So we can just like write and put this file. And I mean, um, if I run systemctl start httpd, I'm not gonna get any errors, uh, mainly because the network was already running. But even if I rebooted the node, and um, since it's already enabled and it started uh, from boot up, uh, it would work just fine, uh, even probably without the other stuff. But like the main point I wanted to show here is that you can enforce a service to start when the network target is reached. So yeah, that's just what I wanted to show. It's a little bit above and beyond, but just uh, wanted to make sure that it was clear. Uh, cool. Now that brings us to our last objective in this domain, which is restrict network access using the firewall. So this is actually pretty vague. I mean, a firewall does all kinds of restricting, so this is its own can of worms, but uh, it really could be its own video. In fact, that's my plan right now, to make a dedicated video about the firewall. What I'll briefly cover here, I guess, is just changing things like the firewall D zone to something else, and we can also uh, go over just removing some network services, because that indeed is restricting network access. So yeah, it definitely answers this objective, so we'll do that. We can start by running firewall-cmd-list-all, and this will show us a bunch of useful information, like the active default zone, what interface is on the zone, uh, the services that are enabled on this zone, and other information, like ports that are enabled, but we don't have any specific ports, so yeah. Uh, what we can do is change the default zone to something else, so first we would want to check what zones are available with firewall-cmd-get zones. And these are the zones uh, that are built into firewall D. Pretty cool. And let's go ahead and change it to the work zone. That sounds pretty restrictive. Should be. Let's find out. So we can do that with firewall-cmd-set default dash zone and set it equal to work and now let's go and check the list all command one more time so it looks almost the same really but let's go ahead and make this a little bit stricter so we'll disable some services like cockpit i guess we don't need that uh, we can also disable ssh like i use this workstation to ssh into other nodes but i don't need to ssh into the workstation itself right so I can disable SSH as well, why not? We can do that with firewall-cmd-permanent. Remember, all of our changes need to persist, so we're going to do this in the permanent configuration. And then dash dash remove dash service, and then we'll remove SSH. There we go, SSH is removed. We can also do the same with cockpit cockpit is removed, and then we'll just run firewall-cmd-reload to reload it into the running configuration. And now if we check firewall cmd list all, we'll see that we have a much stricter setup. So that's good, we definitely made it more restrictive. And I mean, um, that's about all I want to really cover in this video. We definitely did a lot of work here. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I hope you found it useful, and as always, thanks for watching.